Hello and welcome to the lecture chapter one, Distinctions Between Health Promotion and Health Education. This will be a review of the first chapter of the Introduction to Health Promotion and Behavioral Science in Public Health. First, a brief introduction to the chapter. Throughout the chapter, the learning objectives are to describe the field of health promotion and the basic strategies involved, to identify the constructs that are essential to the definition of health education, to describe the knowledge, attitude, behavior, or KAB approach and how health education embodies its assumptions. It is also to identify the fundamental aspects of positivism and how positivists view subjective information. You will also be able to explain inductive and deductive reasonings and how they relate to measures of health promotion and education. And you will be able to describe the evolution of community involvement in regard to health promotion and education. So as you've read in the chapter, you have probably noticed that there are numerous definitions for health promotion and there are several different versions that were discussed throughout the chapter. The most widely used definition is from the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion and that's from the World Health Organization and health promotion is defined in that document as a process of empowering communities to increase control over their own health. What is key is that participation is essential to sustained health promotion actions. So the Ottawa Chap Charter set forth five priority action areas. These five priority action areas include building public health policy, creating supportive environments, strengthening community action, developing personal skills, and reorientating health services. So the World Health Organization goes on to further develop the definition of health promotion through these five specific health action areas. The Ottawa Charter suggests that there are three basic strategies to promote health. These are enabling and empowering individuals to control their determinants of health. They are advocating for improved essential conditions that affect health. And it's mediating between collaborating with different groups and interests across society. Another definition that you came across in the text would be the 1997 Jakarta Declaration. This declaration refined the five priorities listed in the WHO document to include promoting social responsibility for health, increasing investments for health and development, expanding partnerships for health promotion, increasing community capacity and empowering the individual, and securing an infrastructure for health promotion. Now we will talk a lot about the social ecological model and the precede proceed model. The ecological model of public health talks about the interaction among society as a whole, including our international society. It also talks about the interaction among individuals and their health status and the many factors in between, including the macro environmental and the micro environmental levels. That ecological model is a spider web of complexity. So looking at society, individuals, and environment. This is reflected, as I mentioned, in the recent popularity of the social ecological models. Now on to health education. How does this fit in with public health? What 
do you think of when you think of the word health education? Take a moment to reflect on what you think that means. How would you define health education? The technical definition is consciously constructed opportunities for learning involving some form of communication designed to improve health literacy. It also encompasses not only the communication of information, but also the motivation, skills, and confidence a person needs to improve health. Is that what you thought of when you thought of health education or some form of, of these definitions? Well, hopefully you came close. Now, the World Health Definition of health education and health promotion implies but does not stress the changing social, economic, and environmental factors. Now, this is often a critique of the World Health Organization definition. It includes individual risk factors and risk behaviors, but as we know, there are many factors that influence health besides the individual risk factors. So a critique of the who is it does not stress those. It also includes social mobilization and advocacy, but does not tie back into that social, economic, and environmental that we know is so important. As I mentioned, the breadth of the definitions are problematic because they do not include that sense of public health action. And it's not specific to any one activity or set of activities. And there's less distinction between definitions as they have evolved. Many of the definitions you probably notice, they are quite similar. So the definitions overlap environmental health and health services management, maternal and child health, and chronic infectious disease prevention and control are all very complex issues and they have complex definitions and those definitions overlap and that can become problematic when you are trying to strictly define a certain concept or idea and create a program plan. So let's take a little look at the different dimensions of the various definitions of health promotion. So dimension number one involves health education as embodied by the knowledge, behavior, attitude, or KAB approach to improving public health. Now this approach is based on the assumption that changing knowledge and attitudes results in risk factor reduction. So it's the knowledge is power, as you often hear, that once you have the knowledge, your attitude and change in attitude, it will result in a behavior change. The emphasis of health education was to modify mental processes in a way that would result in a behavior change. The next part of this piece is positivism. So it's only phenomenon that can be directly related and reliably measured are the area of interest to science. So the cognitive processes not relevant as they are unique to the person experiencing the process. So the idea that mental processes or cognitive processes are not included in the process is a critique of the current measures of health promotion. Only the behaviors, actions, or outcomes that can be observed are an area of interest to science and to inquiry. So those are what makes my job especially difficult is we want to take into consideration each individual and their cognitive processes and yet what only matters is the output or actions or outcomes, not necessarily the thought process of how they get to those outcomes. Now the consequences of this approach are physical and social. So there's physical and social consequences 
as well. And if you encounter those physical and social consequences, this will make the behavior more likely if consequences are agreeable or less likely if consequences are disagreeable. So if you are liking the results that you see, you are more likely to continue with the behavior, or if there's some reward involved, you're more likely to continue with the behavior. You're less likely to continue with the behavior if the consequences are something that you don't like. The knowledge approach when combined with consequences, so the KABC approach accommodates both the mentalistic and positivistic views. And this is an approach that many people use in the world of public health. Now on to a model for understanding physical activity. We will we'll talk about this in further chapters in depth, but just to give you a sneak peek of what's to come, this has been a particularly challenging area for researchers in health education over the past decade. Now understanding physical activity is typically measured through self-report. And self-report can not be as accurate as other research methods. Now, some people have used uh, Dr. Tom McKenzie's approach, which is direct observation of active and sedentary behaviors. Now, these are supplemented with different variables such as playground structure and leadership of physical education classes. So this is a groundbreaking model that many people can use to understand physical activity. Now, it's not always realistic for researchers to be able to use this model due to the amount of time that direct observation may take. Now on to dimension two. Dimension two is also inclusive of the WHO model. And this technique refers to deductive versus inductive reasoning. So the health behavior field has tended to approach community health promotion through the application of one or more specific psychological or pedagogical theories, such as the health belief model. These health belief and health behavior theories have evolved over years of research and tend to be contextualized within a worldview or model of the human condition in order to structure health promotion or health education. One of these theories is the process that involves a model of logic, referred to as deductive reasoning, whereby one starts with such models or worldview and works down to specific examples of this application. So this is one of the health behavior fields that we use um, is deductive versus inductive reasoning. So as I mentioned, deductive reasoning is theories work down to specific examples and applications. Inductive reasoning talks about the experiences and observations, which can then be developed into a conceptual model. A little bit more about inductive reasoning. It's represented in a variety of efforts. For example, a time series methodology which includes behaviors that are defined and observations taken over a long period of time at regular intervals. And inductive reasoning is used in the fields of anthropology and marketing with focus groups and interviews. And it may be misleading to define health promotion as an academic discipline because of some of the ways that it's represented in the field. We're working to change that through producing and connecting with other majors in the field, but it's a critique of health promotion that some of the scientific-based methods are not used as frequently in the field. Now on to another dimension. Dimension number three, community as a recipient or active participant. So being able to build on successful social change requires a view of the community as a partner in this effort. 
So within traditional public health, including what has been defined as health education, individuals and communities have been looked at largely as passive participants in the health promotion process. Therefore, patient education was conducted largely to complement the work that an expert physician or healthcare provider would give. Over time, these the WHO has defined health education and health promotion and the concept of community health as increasingly active and needing active involvement of the community in its own health challenges and advocacy for community improvement and social justice. So as a result, the individually oriented research on patient education, risk factors reduction has evolved into a much broader approach that gives equal emphasis to physical and social environments. Dimension four goes on to talk about high risk versus the general population. So more than a half century ago, the field of medicine perceived a problem. Patients were leaving the primary care setting or being discharged from the hospital, and yet they weren't following through with the prescribed actions that could maintain the health gains they experienced from treatment. So the forerunners of health promotion, patient educators, came onto the scene to address this problem, often in the form of medical personnel who devoted at least part of their time to patient education. By definition, patient education addressed a high-risk population. Individuals who is seen specifically to address an illness or at least lessen the impact of a disorder on the daily functioning. So this is a historical perspective of high risk versus the general education. We've evolved through that initial part of health education or patient education to a broader, broader model of community health promotion. And we seek to have our resources for those that may be the highest need. So those that are not physically fit or smoke or um, don't fall into that healthy weight range. The book talks about some of these various efforts in chapter one as well. And there's some nice graphs in the book about the population and risk based on health behaviors. One uh, example of the high risk versus general population would be the National High Blood Pressure Education Campaign. Now this was conducted in the 1970s and it was determined that individuals with dangerously high blood pressure were not getting proper care. So the National Institutes of Health net launched a nationwide effort to bring the high blood pressure patients and physicians together. So they addressed smoking, sedentary behavior, and high fat diets. So uh, today we uh, see a lot of these national campaigns about various health. Um, the National Health Observances, for instance, has a national health calendar that you can observe different, almost every single week has a different health observance that you can research. But this wasn't always the case. Back in the 1950s, there were no uh, calendars like the ones that we have today. So this is a fairly recent development in the areas of public health. And the goal behind those national health observances would be to gain control of chronic disease. So in order to do that, we need large community trials and those were launched to help us understand various aspects of health. So. Uh, some of these trials were the Stanford Five City Project, also the Minnesota Pocket health, Heart Health Programs, and those are described in more detail in your book. The reason why this happened is because the U.S. and other countries realized the important gains in chronic disease control, especially in coronary heart disease, and the effects that that can have on a community, on the hospital systems, on the economy, and that social uh, ecological uh, effect is true, especially with those chronic disease 
and infiltrating and promoting health education related to those chronic diseases. In addition, the chapter talks about the risk reduction approach. And this risk reduction approach was developed based on study participants that looked at the types of risk that would need to be reduced in order to achieve optimal health. So the redu reduction of risk characterizes much of health promotion practice today and much of the resources. So the resources are conserved for those that are not physically fit, that smoke, or that weigh too much. Healthy people are not targeted in the risk reduction approach. There's also the population uh, risk approach. This approach, nations and societies look at healthy and unhealthy profiles that cannot be explained by aggregate individual risks. The public health promotion implications are distinct from that high risk approach. And the goal of this population attributable risk is to change entire communities and their social and physical environments. You may recognize some of those social ecological factors when you're thinking about this definition of the PAR. Now, another public health measure that's been looked at over time is HIV and AIDS prevention. So early public health efforts targeted primarily gay men and over time, health professionals realize that it's more complex than just involving gay men that we needed to also involve heterosexuals because many more people were found to be at risk. Uh, back when HIV and AIDS was first discovered, there was a lot of misconceptions about HIV and AIDS, and a lot of work has been done to help decrease the stigma and also to aggressively control HIV and AIDS, such as uh, providing education, pr promoting condom use, and promoting proper testing of STIs, HIV, and AIDS. So the target now is everyone instead of just being one specific group of people. Now on to another dimension of public health. Western culture versus traditional values versus universalism. Health promotion research is done often done by Western academics and officials. People much like myself are doing research However, our worldview is very focused. We can take research from the people that are around us. So oftentimes uh, it is white Caucasian males of college age that participate in these studies. And this is due to limited financial resources of non-Western countries. So oftentimes the approaches that we're taking and the information we gather about approaches we should take are based off of a very select group of people. This is very unfortunate because the results that we have may not be transferable to other populations. And we are unable to examine the degree that American society and cultural influences have on public health approaches. So most health behavior theories are developed like I said, based on this Western perception and may not be able to integrate into other cultures. Now on to social change impacting health behavior. So on your screen, there's various social movements that have happened over the past years. The first is Social Security, which was developed in the 1930s. And this led uh, has is really a hot topic right now, especially considering that uh, Social Security might run out or not be available for future generations. And that impact might mean less access to resources due to the fact that there's less funds available for older generations once they retire. Also, the GI Bill in the 1940s, this helps promote education 
for veterans, which was a very good thing and helped promote and get a lot of people into schools. Also in the 1950s, what happened was the desegregation of schools and public places. So there was no longer the white only schools or the black only schools. They were integrated, blacks and whites were integrated together in the 1950s. Medicare, Medicaid, and Head Start were developed in the 1960s, and those are supplemental programs for low income or people with certain chronic conditions that you can qualify for. If you don't qualify for the age, you might qualify for aid based on your medical status. Now, all of these programs were developed and are still part of our day-to-day -day lives. They also have reciprocating consequences and social changes that impact those health behaviors. So I want you to just think about how policy can affect health. So access to health care, for instance, how does that impact health? Access to education, how does access to education impact health? Being and enforcing equitable change, such as the integration of all people into our education systems, how does that affect health? Thinking about those things will all help all of us to implement better programs and uh, respond to certain social justice issues. Recently, there's been certain political trends and those political trends also influence our health behavior and influence our ability to do our jobs as health promoters. So the more conservative political trends have widened the gap between the rich and the poor. So there also with this gap widening is a diminished sense of collective responsibility for health, education, and the welfare of all people. So certain political parties have aligned themselves to certain political issues and without getting too much into the politics, there is a sense of collective responsibility with certain political agendas, and there's a diminished sense of collective responsibility with other political agendas. So us as health professionals need to be aware of what those political agendas and trends are so that we can support candidates that will help further our cause and help the collective overall. And also healthcare reform is not as robust as what is needed. And that is also going to greatly affect our jobs in the future. Now, I don't want to forget about the underdeveloped and newly developed countries. So rural communities are shrinking and that causes a loss of impact on traditional values and social norms. For instance, I live in Duluth, Minnesota, and we have a relatively large indigenous population. And some of the indigenous people have entered into our public school systems and are losing some of their traditional heritage and traditional culture because of their matriculation into our current school system. So that loss of traditional values and social constructs can really harm their community because they no longer feel connected to previous generations and they feel socially isolated trying to live in both the both worlds. Some of the other challenges would be the electronic interconnectedness is challenging community definitions. So what does it mean when you belong to a certain group of online community? Let's say you're an online gamer and that's your social connectedness. What does that mean compared to belonging to a group that meets in person? How does electronic interconnectedness differ than non-electronic interconnectedness and what implications does that have for health? We don't quite know all of the effects of these electronic environments and what that means. Lastly, personal responsibility of individuals for one's own health is being redefined. 
So how do we look at the individual? What does it mean to be an individual in our society today? And what does it mean to work within a community as a health promotion? So overall, the fields of health promotion and health education are very closely related and encompass virtually all public health actions involving individuals, communities, and organizations. Health promotion, as described in the Ottawa Charter, is the process of improving health by enabling individuals to increase control over specific health factors. So that includes their social and economic perceptions and realities. It includes their physical environment and behaviors. The overall aim is prevention of serious health risks before they occur. Health education encompasses these efforts to share health-related knowledge with the goal of increasing a person's motivation to change their own health and their health behaviors and their attitudes. So we'll go on to further discuss effective communication and theories and models that inform health education and influence health, health promotion. Overall, I want you to remember that these definitions of health promotion and health education are grounded in the Western ideals and they might not be appropriate for all developing countries and developing worlds because they don't follow the same traditions that we follow and have the same experiences that we experience. So being aware of the individual and their background and their attitudes is essential in order to promote and build a program. So you'll be asked to read chapter one and review this lecture as needed and take some time to look at the review questions at the end of the chapter. This concludes the review of chapter one. Thank you.